Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and we are beginning Unit 2, Section 7, which is about how we visualize chemical bonds and visualize these molecules in three dimensions. So let's jump right in here and talk about what chemical bonds can look like. So let's imagine that we have a single bond. So imagine we have two carbon atoms like this, and there's a single bond. Normally, what you would see would be that the two electrons are being shared pretty much straight in between those two atoms right there, which is probably what you would have expected. Now let's take a look at a double bond. If we have a carbon-carbon double bond, once you notice that this is a little bit different, we have two bonds that have to be placed in there somehow, and that first bond is going to be shared right in the middle, just like it was in the single, but your second bond here is going to be shared in a somewhat different way. We have a some this, this sort of a looped configuration. And so that is what your double bond is, for the most part, going to look like. Now what about a triple bond? Because somehow in a triple bond, you have to be able to fit in not one or two, but actually three bonds into that little space there. Well, here is how that would work. You'd have one of the bonds that's, that's in that straight conformation, just like we had in the others. But now we have a looped bond going in this direction, and then there's a second looped bond that's actually, and this is kind of hard to tell, it's actually coming out at us. It is in that third dimension. And so we have two looped bonds and one straight bond in a triple bond. Now, the straight bonds are given a name. Those are called sigma bonds. And we represent that with the Greek letter sigma, this little lowercase sigma that kind of looks like a cursive O. And notice that every one of these bonds has exactly one sigma bond. Now, the double bond and the triple bond have these looped bonds. Those are called pi bonds, just like the Greek letter pi that you use in math. So you have that lowercase pi, and a double bond has one of these pi bonds. A triple bond has a sigma and two pi bonds. So that's how these bonds are basically configured. Sigma bonds, just so you know, uh, are called that because they're the result of overlapping s orbitals. As we've learned uh, previously, s orbitals are spherical in shape, whereas pi bonds are the result of overlapping p orbitals, and so they have that more of a looped shape. Uh, and so we have sigma and pi. Now, some observations about the bonds. I tried to draw it in this way, but just so that everyone is on the same page about this, notice that I drew the single bonds as the longest of the bonds. Triple bonds are the shortest bond length. Double bonds are in the middle. If you look at the way I had them configured, I, I tried to draw them like that, but make sure that you are aware of that. Single bonds are the longest. Triple bonds are the shortest. Every single bond is a sigma bond. Every double bond has one sigma and one pi bond. And every triple bond has one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Now, with that information right there, you should be able to count up the number of sigma and pi bonds in any molecule that anyone could draw for you. Now we're going to try a couple examples of this. Let's take a look at HCN and we're going to figure out how many sigma bonds and pi bonds there are here. Well, hopefully you see that there's a single bond, so that's a sigma. And then there's a triple bond, which is one sigma and two pi. So when you add it up, it's two sigma and two pi bonds. So hopefully that's not too difficult. What if I were to give you a much more complex molecule, something like this, maybe some sort of a, an organic molecule? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. You, you notice that there are a lot of single bonds in here. In fact, every one of those single bonds is going to be a sigma bond. All Basically, all six of those single bonds are sigmas. There are a couple of double bonds in here that I see as well. And each of those double bonds, this one as well as that one, will have one sigma and one pi. So we have those in there. And then there's a triple bond in, in here, which is a sigma and two pi. So when you add up these sigmas and pi's, hopefully you can see that we have a total of nine sigma bonds and four 
pi bonds. So that's how you can count up sigma bonds and pi bonds. Now another very important part of being able to, uh, to visualize molecules is to understand that there's something called hybridization of orbitals in these molecules. Now if we think about a fairly simple molecule like methane, one that we've probably drawn a couple times already, it has this structure. We have the carbon atom in the middle, the central atom, and then we have four sigma bonds, four single bonds there, and we have that molecule. But if we start thinking about this, we might think that there's something wrong with this structure. Now what could be wrong with this structure? Well, let's think about the electron configuration of carbon. Carbon is there in the middle. It has four valence electrons. That's the electron configuration of carbon. And the valence electrons are the only ones that are participating in the bonding. So the ones we care about are the 2s2 and the 2p2 electrons. So when we plot those on an orbital diagram notation here, we have 2s, which has the two uh, electrons there, and 2p, following Hund's rule, is going to look like this. And based upon what I see here, I only see two electrons that are looking for a partner. It, it looks like there are only two electrons that are available for bonding. And so if carbon can only make two bonds, how is it possible that carbon is drawn here making four bonds? How is that possible? Well, it makes us wonder, does this molecule exist? Well, it certainly does exist, and this is the correct Lewis electron dot diagram. So what's going on? Well, the carbon atom in the center there is undergoing something called hybridization. Its orbitals are hybridized. Now, here's how this works. We have these, these four orbitals that we're looking at here. There's one s orbital, and we have three p orbitals, and they go through a hybridization process. And then we have these four electrons, and they're, you know, each, each of those electrons is able to occupy a hybridized orbital. So now we have four electrons in four hybridized orbitals. Now, what are these orbitals? Well, they're not fully s, and they're not fully p either. In fact, we can say that they are uh, one part s and three parts p, or as we might say, s p3 hybridized. And so we would say that the carbon atom in the methane molecule has sp3 hybridization. Now, how can we determine that for any central atom in a molecule? Because pretty much any molecule that has a central atom is going to do something like this. Well, here's how you do it. It's actually very simple. If you've been uh, following along with sigma bonds and pi bonds and understanding how these structures work. All you have to do is add the number of sigma bonds on an atom to the number of unshared electron pairs that are touching that atom. And when you do that, you're going to get a number that's in between 2 and 6. Now, that number actually has a name. That's called the steric number. And we uh, sometimes use that to talk about electron geometry, as we're going to here in our next video. But if that number ends up being 2, then we say the hybridization is sp, one part s, one part p. If the sum ends up being 3, the hybridization is sp2. If the sum is 4, then the hybridization is sp3. If it happens to be 5, then we go up to sp3 dehybridization. And if the sum happens to be 6, we call it sp3 d2 hybridization. Now we're going to do a few examples with this. Let's see if we can determine the hybridization of the central atom in each of these molecules. So here's HCN. We've looked at this molecule a few times already. So once again, focus on the central atom. How many sigma bonds do we have here? Well, there's one, and then there's one over here. That's two. How many unshared pairs on that carbon? Well, I don't see any. 
So 2 plus 0 is 2. So the steric number is 2. So what's the hybridization? SP. SP hybridization. That's all you have to do. Now how about water? Well, how many sigma bonds are on that central atom right there? Well, I see two. There's one, and then there's two. So we have two. And how many unshared pairs? Well, we have two. There's one right there, and one right there. So two plus two equals four. So what's the hybridization if the steric number is four? Well, that chart tells us it is sp3. And how about this structure here? We have the nitrate polyatomic ion. So what's the hybridization of that nitrogen in the middle? Well, how many sigma bonds? One, two, three. Because one of those is a pi bond and doesn't count. Any unshared pairs on the nitrogen? There aren't, are there? So three plus zero equals three. And that steric number of three gets us a hybridization of sp2. So that's how we do hybridization. Uh, it's not hard. And just so you know, on the AP exam, if you're taking AP chemistry, uh, they're not going to, to use any hybridizations beyond sp3 on the exam. So if you learn something about sigma and pi bonds or something about hybridization, please shoot me a thumbs up. And I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to continue with Unit 2, Section 7, learning about molecular geometry and bond angles.